Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the big data session of the Summer Seminar 2023. So this year, our presentations will be focusing on the one big data set that we are all want to know more about. That's the connected vehicle data set. All three presentations are related to the connected vehicle data set applications. And we have a very diverse panel over here. We have one presentation each from academia, GDOT, and consultancy. And our presentations will be focusing on interstate mobility, traffic signal performance measures, and also how we can use big data to solve Georgia's transportation problems. So on that note, I'll introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jairaj Deshai. Dr. Jairaj is a transportation research engineer with a joint transportation research program at Purdue University. Desai received his PhD in civil engineering and a Master of Science in Aeronautics and Astronautics from Purdue University and a Bachelor's in Aerospace Engineering from IIT Kharagpur back in India. He specializes in developing and analyzing big data-driven visualizations and applications that combine diverse data sets and help draw actionable insights aiding public and private sector stakeholders in the operational decision making and resource allocation. On that note, I'll welcome Dr. Jairaj for his presentation titled National Interstate Mobility Analysis Using Connected Vehicle Data. I just use this one. Oh. All right, sorry about that. Thank you, uh, Matthews, for the introduction. Um, so the title of my talk today is National Interstate Mobility Analysis Using Connected Vehicle Data. Uh, so just to preface the talk, uh, this resulted from a sample data set we received uh, for two months in 2022, August and December, for the entire United States for connected vehicle data. And we felt this provided a good dual perspective on construction in the summer and winter weather in December. So we chose these two months for the analysis. Uh, so just a brief outline of how I'll be structuring this. So starting out with the connected vehicle data, we used how the nationwide volume looks and what the data description is. Uh, yeah, it's not going into. So uh, I'll start out with a description of the data we're using, some of the mobility visuals we've developed to uh, track interstate mobility, so trip counts, heat maps, speed profiles, and congestion uh, tickers, followed by how we can use these visuals for the dual applications of work zone uh, construction season, for real-time decision making and after action review, as well as for winter weather applications, and how we've been able to integrate these uh, data sets with NOAA weather data, which is nationwide, and how that has helped uh, decision makers. And finally, ending with the summary. So starting with the data description, so this is a slide my advisor, Dr. Bullock, use, likes to use a lot, which basically says that our vehicles know more about our roads than we do. And I think this sums up connect the connected vehicle data set really well, because connected vehicle data, we believe, is really important for understanding and managing construction work zone traffic, as well as winter weather maintenance operations, and has the added benefit of uh, being uh, sensor-free. So as long as you have data available in the region, you can uh, track operations there. So to start with the data description, what we've used for this study is connected vehicle trajectory data, and just showing the, the five basic attributes we use from each trajectory record is the anonymized trajectory ID. Uh, so this is obfuscated from the data provider, uh, a lat long to tell us where the connected vehicle is, a timestamp to go with that, the speed at which the vehicle is traveling, and a heading. 
uh, this heading is what actually helps us put a vehicle on either direction of travel. So if you get a bunch of points on I-95 on north and south, this helps us sort it out on the northbound or the southbound direction of travel. And uh, we get these data points every three seconds, as shown in the figure here, and at a three meter uh, geolocation fidelity. So about a parking spot level resolution, which we feel is uh, really good enough for this analysis. Uh, to show the nationwide volume, so we've done this study for August and December, but I wanted to show the latest numbers. So for December 2022, uh, the nationwide data set included 503 billion records, about the same number for August, a little lower, because as we know, connected vehicle data penetration increases uh, uh, every single day. And unsurprisingly, Texas, Florida, California, New York are the top four states with uh, connected vehicle data. Uh, to show the national coverage for just one minute on December 12, 2022. So this is noon uh, to 12.01 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, 21 million records is what we see in a single minute. And this is how uh, those breadcrumbs look like. Uh, so as we see, most of the major cities are highlighted. Most of the major roadways are highlighted, definitely, all of the interstates. Uh, so moving on to the mobility visuals. So using this connected vehicle trajectory data set, the four main things we've broken this down into is trip counts, heat maps, speed profiles, and congestion tickers. So as we all know, with uh, the new $7.5 billion uh, investment into EV charging infrastructure to get a national charging network by the end of the decade, uh, the most important thing we need to know right now is where EVs are currently driving and where we think they will be driving. So we can just define where to place the next charging infrastructure investment. And uh, this is one of those visuals we feel uh, really shows the current penetration of EVs and going into the future will provide longitudinal tracking of how and where EVs are traveling. So this is an example from I-10 in California. And on the left and right is eastbound and westbound. And the y-axis you see here is uh, 240 miles, so the mile marker on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is the number of trips. And uh, an added benefit of connected vehicle data is it allows us to classify a trip based on the fuel it's using. So either a hybrid vehicle, an internal combustion engine vehicle, or an EV, which will be very valuable for uh, the coming years. So as shown by the example here at mile marker 20 on I-10 West, we see 3,000 EV trips, 1,000 hybrid trips, and 75,000 ICE vehicle trips for uh, the entire month of December. And these are unique trips. Uh, again, we can do this state by state, route by route, uh, section by section, but if at the federal level you're looking at an entire corridor, how do you do that uh, without having sensors everywhere? So this is another benefit of connected vehicle data. It gives us visibility into cross-country routes and operations at the border as well. So at the border between two states, if you're looking to place a charger there, you need to know how, uh, how what's the volume of vehicles traveling there. So this shows I-10 uh, for all the states it passes through, from California all the way to Florida. And uh, again, this is a percentage visualization of the same, showing uh, how many percent do EVs account for uh, the current volume of connected vehicle data right now. So as we see, the national volume is about 3 to 4% growing by 1% every year. But this is another graphic that lets you dive deep into a route by route and state by state level on the 4% national value, does that track with every single state, or does each state have a different penetration? So, And this is a more condensed visualization, because as we know, penetration of electric vehicles is very low right now. So we've clipped the access down to 30% to show, like I-10 in California at um, the West Coast shows penetration as high as 16, 10%. But as we go further towards the east coast of Florida, that penetration goes down into less than half a percent. Uh, another visualization which uh, the state of Indiana and multiple other states and the federal level have found very useful is heat maps. So these heat maps basically show on the x-axis is your time of day and on the y-axis is the mile marker. And the top and bottom reflect the two directions of travel for I-10 in California. So 240 miles eastbound on the top, westbound on the bottom. And we've used these heat maps for at least the past five to seven years uh, to do weekly updates on construction work zones in Indiana. And again, this is actually leading to a pool fund study with uh, two other states starting uh, this summer, where we'll be doing similar visualizations for uh, Texas and Pennsylvania as well. So again, week by week, it, 
uh, these heat maps are really easy to read. Uh, uh, speeds in green are good, so free flow speeds above 55, above 65, red, purple, and pink are bad speeds. You don't want to see that congested regimes. And this lets you easily show uh, where there's recurring condition that you would expect and where there's non-recurring condition like a crash incident or a maintenance operation, which uh, you might want to know how it impacted uh, interstate travel. Uh, like I said earlier, not only at the state level, but this lets us do cross-country heat maps. So this is I-65 northbound uh, from Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Indiana, the four states it passes through. And we've chosen this state because this is the week of Christmas, and I'm sure all of us have experienced that winter storm that came through. And this is slowly going into how we can use the same visuals that we use for work zone season to also look at how uh, winter storms or inclement weather impacts interstate mobility. So if you look at this line here, uh, I'm not sure if my mouse pointer is visible, but uh, right after noon on December 22nd, we can see a storm front moving in. So you see speeds going from the highest level, so that's above 65, to a little darker green, and then going into the congested regime, below 45 miles an hour. And this is how we can directly track when a storm front is moving in, in which state, at what mile marker, and how that actually impacted traffic. Uh, similar, I'll just do a eye doctor test here for northbound and southbound. And this is, again, important because some storms, as we know, are directional. Uh, wind direction has a huge, uh, is a huge factor in impacting traffic. It may impact northbound, but not southbound. And that's where this is helpful. So uh, going one level higher, a visualization that not uh, lets you track uh, interstate mobility at a monthly level. So we're basically collapsing the heat map and uh, showing you at what mile marker for the entire month do you see the most congested uh, travel. So this is, again, the I-10 California example. So for the month, of, on the y-axis is the 240 miles, and on the x-axis is the hours of the month. So we'd have 720 hours. We've clipped this to 200 hours because most of the travel that we would see is free flow travel. But if you clip it as 200 hours, we see most of the congestion is within the first 40 miles, which is on the west coast in the major metropolitan cities. And as you go into rural California from mile marker 160 and eastward, you see that condition dissipate. And most of that is only uh, non-recurring condition due to crash incidents or uh, other. Uh, similarly, the same speed profile, but cross country. So I-10 uh, for about the 10 states it passes through, and we see California accounts for the highest congestion hours on I-10, followed by Texas, which is as expected, and then uh, Louisiana on the border. Uh, this is the highest level of aggregation we've done, which is at the US level, the entire interstate system for all 50 states and DC. If you want to see how congestion looked like for the month, this is what uh, December 1 to December 31 look like. So there's easily discernible patterns of recurring congestion on the weekdays. And uh, weekends, you can easily see Saturday and Sunday show the dips, as you would expect. But one interesting thing to note here is on uh, starting December 21 to Christmas, we see a couple of states showing really high congested miles, which is due to the December Christmas storm. And this is a really quick way to tell which states and which interstates and which states were the most impacted. So Ohio and Indiana and Pennsylvania from this plot. Um, this is uh, the final visual we have, which is aggregating the miles. Of, so the number of miles of interstate that were congested, that's basically operating below 45 miles an hour, and aggregating that to a daily level. So how many mile hours were congested? So miles of congestion times the hours they were congested for, and for every single day, for every single US state. And this, again, shows a similar pattern. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, December 3 and 4, and the other weekend show a dip as well. But you can see clear weekday patterns, starting with an increase on Monday, with the highest on Friday. And again, uh, the Christmas storm impacting Ohio, Pennsylvania is very easily visible here. So at the federal level, if you're tracking interstate mobility due to construction or weather, this is a really quick visual. Uh, Cross-country triggers. So now, uh, the earlier graphic I showed was for the entire interstate system. Now, if you're only inter interested in I-80 or I-70, let's say, that this is a condensed version of the same. So this shows I-80 and all the states it passes through, uh, and a minute-by-minute -minute count of how many miles were congested. So at its peak, if you see uh, 
over here, almost 160 miles of I-80 were congested at the peak of the winter storm, which is, uh, and again, the states that were most affected by it. Similar visual, but uh, for mile hours of congestion. So if you want to do it at the daily level or at the one minute level, these are the available options. So now, uh, in the interest of time, I'll run through the next few slides quick, but how we can use this in work zone applications. So the heat maps that I showed earlier, they're useful for, uh, Indiana has a suite of dashboards that we use in real time. So every minute we get new data on that heat map and we can track if there's an active work zone or an active maintenance operation, we can see how traffic is reacting to that, how much is traffic queuing, or if there's a crash in progress, how is recovery going on? So this is one example from I-78 New Jersey that I chose. Uh, if you look at the bottom on the I-78 westbound heat map, uh, around mile marker 10 to 15, we see these interesting patterns here, which are very thin slices of congestion, but uh, we wanted to investigate what that was. So on further uh, investigation, we found out this was a rock blasting project, which was scheduled Monday to Friday from 9 to 3 with 15-minute road closures last summer. And you can clearly see Monday to Friday, you see the closure every day, and then nothing on Saturday and Sunday. And if you zoom into the heat map, we see these, if you see the white patches here, just below the condition, that's when we have no data. That's basically no cars are driving through, which is a road closure. So as promised, this was a 15-minute road closure, but if you want to evaluate like how, how much of an impact did the 15-minute closure have, we can see from here the maximum condition, the maximum queuing we could see was from mile marker 12 all the way up to 16. So four miles was the worst instance of queuing, which uh, really quick way to evaluate. Uh, that was an instance of a planned uh, maintenance event. This is uh, an instance of a non-recurring condition. So a crash incident on I-10 in California, uh, which blocked traffic for several hours. And we see uh, the queue here building up from mile marker 160 to about 180. So this is an example of if we have this real-time dashboard operating, or agencies have this, uh, they can track in real time how recovery is going, how far back the queuing has uh, reached. And finally, going into winter weather, I wanted to show another example of uh, I-70 eastbound. So again, this is a 10-state heat map, so all the way from Utah to Maryland, west to east. And for the week of Christmas, which again saw the winter storm, and we can see eastbound and westbound, I'll just flip through these. And we see how the storm front rolls in first in Colorado, uh, resulting in the most condition, then moves on to uh, Kansas, Missouri, and then uh, Indiana, and Ohio look, is the most impacted by this event, because this takes about 30, 36 to 48 hours to clear up. And the final integration we've done is integrating this connected vehicle data with publicly available NOAA weather data. So this is the high resolution rapid refresh data set, which basically does an 18 hour forecast of what weather is going to be looking like. And this is a quick visualization. We did uh, a, a 120 hour time lapse video of how weather and connected vehicle data looked for that period. So I. I let this video play through, but if you see the time on the top, that shows uh, we're on December 25th right now. It should reset to December 20th. There, go there it goes. And we see the storm front coming in at the top, impacting Colorado first. You see, as soon as it hit Col it's Colorado, speeds go into the congested regime. It all turns red. Then it hits Indiana, turning speeds congested, Ohio. And Ohio is the state that shows the most lasting impact. So even after the storm has passed on the 23rd, we still see speeds congested. Uh, until recovery on the 24th. Uh, so to summarize, I just wanted to say winter weather and construction work zones, as we know, have a national impact on mobility. And this, was, this study was our attempt at using connected vehicle data to provide a national outlook at interstate mobility and how easily this could be done in real time or as an after action. Uh, crowdsource vehicle data can provide important information for real time decision making and after action reviews. And we believe it's essential to integrate with weather data to uh, tie in and correlate how weather actually impacts mobility. Uh, just to show the scale of this data, this is one trillion connected vehicle records and 103 billion weather records. Uh, finally, I want to thank the entire team at JTRP that worked on this and my advisor, Dr. Darcy Bullock, at the top. And uh, everything I talked about here today, I know I used very few examples, selected ones, but 
this report that I have here on the QR code, this includes uh, all of these visuals I presented for every single state and DC and every interstate in those states. So please feel free to access it there. And uh, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jairaj, for letting us know how we can manage interstate traffic so effectively using connected vehicle data by assessing each and every factor that impacts the traffic on interstates. And also for setting the foundation on how to understand connected vehicle data, how it works. That sets the stage for our next presentation, so thank you for that as well. So we have questions at the end of all three presentations, so keep your thinking caps on and have questions prepared at the end. So on that note, I'll introduce and welcome our second speaker, whom we all know. So Justin Hatch, a graduate of Georgia Institute of Technology. Justin has been working with GDOT for almost 10 years. He spent, he has, over these 10 years, he spent time in District 5, District 7, and the State Traffic Operations Office. And in his current role, he serves as the Assistant State Traffic Engineer, leading the state's signal operations and maintenance programs as well as the state's connected vehicle goals. And Justin is also a proud husband and father to son Henry and daughter Ruth. On that note, I welcome Justin for his presentation on next generation traffic signal performance measures using CDL. Next generation traffic signal performance measures. So um, this conference was, oh, sorry. We'll give it a minute. This conference was um, very well timed for this topic. Um, primarily what I'm doing is presenting on the findings of a pooled fund study. Um, it's officially, I believe, titled the Enhanced Traffic Signal Performance Measures. Um, that pooled fund study, I think it's going to catch up from what happened before. There we go. Um, was started in 2018 um, as much of a continuation and to uh, complement past work on automated traffic signal performance measures. Um, this pooled fund study was focused uh, on two separate goals, but the main one we're talking about today uh, was to utilize um, connected vehicle trajectory data in order to compute um, new traffic signal performance measures previously um, either not possible or not as effective as what we can do now with this data. Uh, really quickly, an overview. Uh, we'll touch briefly on those ATSPMs and current practices, but not too in depth. We will uh, talk about vehicle probe data, primarily how it applies to traffic signals as we're talking exactly about, um, I believe, the exact same data that Rajaj was just presenting on. Um, just applied to arterials and traffic signals. Uh, then we'll jump into some specific applications of that um, visualizations and performance reporting tools, but the Purdue probe, probe diagram, arterial travel time reporting measures, as well as other performance reporting for corridors and networks, um, and some other specific applications. Starting to worry, I have an old presentation here. Um, Apologies, the formatting didn't come through here perfectly, apparently, but uh, I wanted to make sure uh, this is very much, again, a summary of that um, pooled fund study report that just came out on the 6th. Um, and so I wanted to make sure to note of, recognize all of the authors on that study as well as the other um, agencies who contributed to that pooled fund study. You'll see some familiar names if you're familiar with ATSPM um, as far as the agencies and um, Jiraj, uh is one of the authors. <laughs> you got questions, I'm sure Jirash will take them. Uh, so again, briefly on ATSPMs, they're a set of data visualizations tools used to create um, traffic signal performance measures. Um, and really what they're primarily used for is to identify um, hotspots and issues so that you can better leverage your traffic signal um, and uh, staff resources in order to appropriately address issues with your signal timing. Um, so that was initially started um, out of Indiana in 2005, a 
pooled fund study was begun um, for automated traffic signal performance measures in 2012. That, um, I guess, kind of segued into this study a bit in 2018, and I think officially ended in 2019. Um, 31 states, uh, to some level by 2019, had begun some level of practice with ATSPMs, not necessarily implemented throughout their agencies, but were working with it. Um, and while that was a, a very good adoption rate, it did actually fall slightly short of their goal, I believe, of 35 agencies. Um, there's a few reasons for that. ATSPMs do generally involve a significant capital um, investment and maintenance of your infrastructure in order to enable them. So um, deploying traffic signal controllers, uh, software that's capable of processing that data, um, you need to maintain not only your vehicle detectors, because if you lose your detection, you lose a lot of that beneficial data, but you also need to maintain a robust um, communications network. Thankfully, in Georgia, um, and really what I learned from um, being a piece of this pooled fund study for just the tail end of it, um, we're very lucky in Georgia. We have all of those things well built out, um, thanks to a lot of uh, planning and funding um, and hard work for people from people over the last 10 years or so and before that. But um, so we have all of that, but that's those challenges, those barriers are tough for certain states in order to get ATSPMs launched. Um, and so this uh, trajectory data starts to provide other states benefits um, where they may not have the capital investment, but also benefits to Georgia to carry um, traffic signal performance measures in a different direction. All right, uh, connected vehicle probe data. Um, again, if you're kind of wondering, probe data has obviously been around for quite a bit, but um, for traffic signals in particular, or even intersection analysis in general, uh, probe data has often been linked to segments, um, segment-based vendor, segment vendor data. And so because we can't precisely define exactly where um, where those vehicles are, it prevents um, certain traffic signal measures we might want to pull out of probe data. Um, uh, uh, about, I don't think I need to hit this. We've touched on all of this, Jiraj. Uh, the biggest thing I would touch on vehicle trajectories, because that's mostly what I'm going to be jumping into today and for traffic signals, is that three second interval. What that's going to give you is three seconds from the start of your trip to the end of your trip. It's not going to matter how far you are away from an intersection. Um, and so just keep that in mind. Again, that unique trajectory identifier that Jiraj mentioned as well is highly beneficial um, as we go through this. I think these numbers match up perfectly, so it's great. Uh, we didn't even talk and they're the same numbers, but over 500 billion uh, monthly trajectory records across the country, uh, something I would touch on to make it feel more real. You know, Georgia's about eighth on that list, um, which is what you would expect. And if you were to, you know, three seconds, uh, three second resolution on that. If you calculate that out, that was 15 million hours of travel time in the state of Georgia um, at 15 billion, I think it was, records a month. So that's, it's a lot of data that's coming in um, that's relevant to what we're trying to do. Uh, you can see some penetration data here as well. And so that changes slightly. Um, the highest states are not the highest, uh, the highest states with the most data aren't necessarily the highest with penetration. Um, it's just important to keep in mind, yes, in certain cases, you may find a corridor that, you know, this data is not currently available, um, but data, or just, just not as, uh, the penetration rate isn't quite as high. Data aggregation methods do exist, and so generally what you're doing is taking data from a week or a month and um, pulling it in by the same time of day so that you can get um, relevant metrics for that time period. Um, a couple of things we've thrown, you'll see connected vehicle in this presentation a lot. It's important to realize, you know, that's, those are vehicles that are rolling off the, off the assembly line with, that are connected vehicle enabled. They have, um, you know, they have those communication technologies and they're recording data. However, they're not communicating with infrastructure at all to pull this data in. And so we don't have um, signal phasing and timing data. So we can't do um, phase, by phase by phase evaluations of traffic signal operations. We st can still do quite a lot of useful stuff, but just don't conflate those terms too much. Um, and then it's really important to keep in mind, you know, as we start to work with this data, it's, you know, there's not only that cost of acquisition, um, but that, that 15 billion records in Georgia total to 1.8 terabytes per month, um, just for what we're looking at here. And so that's a lot of data, not only to store, 
but you also have to make plans how you're going to access that data to run queries on it. Um, and so long term, that's just something to keep in mind. It's not, not too simple. Um, all right, diving into what the data actually does. So here we've just got a map. Um, these are event data or event um, observation or event locations, and they're color coded by a hard breaking event or hard acceleration event. Um, and you can roughly start to see, yeah, this is about what we would expect. You've got hard breaking events happening upstream of the signal as they're entering um, a dilemma zone or closer to the stop bar. You've got hard acceleration event events generally just past the stop bar um, or at the stop bar. Maybe if someone's trying to clear a section, an intersection that's yellow maybe a hard acceleration on green. You've got several um, occurring for those right turn vehicles entering the main line traffic. You can kind of notice to, or start to pick those out. Um, looking at the speeds, we can see that those events don't, you know, generally you could break hard from 40 miles an hour from 10 miles an hour. You could also do the same with acceleration. We see that across the board. Um, and then looking at the heading data, that starts to become beneficial. Generally, just what you'd expect, you can start to pick out the lanes and see that this just confirms what you would see. But there's a couple of, of spots in there where it appears, you know, that parking space width or so of accuracy for the GPS is slightly off. And so that heading data starts to get beneficial to confirm your, your lane and your direction and your movement through the intersection. Uh, Trajectory data. Uh, so this is again mostly what we're talking about today, and you can see, like I said, once you have that that GPS location of a vehicle every three seconds, you don't have to rely on vehicle detectors. Um, you don't have predefined segments. We just have all of these locations where vehicles are as they're approaching an intersection. So that starts to become highly beneficial, whether you're uh, based on what data we had previously, um, even for ATSPMs. Um, this is just the speed uh, data for those same points, um, green is faster, red is slower. So we can see that vehicles generally slow down near an intersection, even if they're not necessarily stopping, they tend to, to slow, which is what we would expect. And your heading data, um, something cool you'll notice is you can easily pick out uh, a trip deviation that someone's making, uh, maybe going through a drive through or just parking and then coming back. Uh, that starts to become, come in handy later on. And so in this format, um, you know, not very easy to analyze. We need to do a few things with that data first. And so that unique trajectory ID comes in a lot of good use. And so um, by having a an ID tied to each or each waypoint, we know that that single trajectory belongs to a single vehicle and we track that vehicle, you know, through its approach, through the signal and on through other signals. Um, and so the biggest thing that we do first is uh, linear referencing. And so all we're doing is determining generally the far side of the intersection. Some of these examples use the stop bar, but you're going to, you know, make a zero reference point and then measure the approximate linear distance to each waypoint in order to get what is hopefully very familiar there on the far right side, just a time space diagram essentially where uh, the y axis is how far you are from your reference point you've set up. The x-axis is your time, and so you, uh, hopefully if you're uh, used to ATSPMs, you're familiar with that. If not, um, can share some links and get you up to speed on it. So this is um, that same data we were looking at, those points, uh, and we picked out the eight trajectories within it that are all going the same direction, um, and then pasted alongside of it uh, the um, what we'll eventually call the Purdue probe diagram, but the time, a time space diagram showing each vehicle trajectory. Um, vehicles are moving down the screen, uh, looking at that dark blue air, arrow, and then we can see a few things that call out number one. You can see a vehicle that maybe had to tap the brakes a couple of times, but passed through the signal reasonably. Um, call out three, we can see a vehicle that had to stop 700 feet upstream, um, but looking at some of those other ones, you can see you've got vehicles making full stops over 1,000 feet from the signal. And so uh, if you're keeping up, generally, we would not have uh, that ability to know that that queue was that far back. You start to get into interesting things where that might have, if you look at the, the rest of that trajectory, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, um, that might look like an arrival on green based on general detector metrics or general ATSPM metrics, general current ATSPM metrics. Um, so we can do the same again. We don't have to just stop at one signal. We can uh, pull up 
that, that time-space diagram for the entire corridor, and we can see four traffic signals here, and we can start to see that some vehicles do, in fact, make it through this entire corridor. Uh, most tend to make it through that intersection B. These are just those blue lines across the screen that are rec representing intersections. Um, we can see a lot of vehicles have to stop at intersection C, and you can even see one vehicle at the end there with call out four and five that have to stop twice. Um, and so this is really good. We can start to observe progression through multiple intersections very easily rather than just looking at arrivals on green for one intersection, say. Um, and ultimately, this is building out a, a framework for corridor analysis. One other thing, I won't get into it. Uh, I tried to read it and understand it. Jiraj, you might be able to help me. Uh, they have got a couple of methodologies in the pooled fund study for this, but if you want to analyze you know, signal performance metrics, you want to understand individual movements and how they're progressing through an intersection. That la those last graphics we were going through, we just had the benefit of this already being done. But certainly as you go into this, you need to have an automated process to take all of that data and identify a movement through an intersection. So that's in the study. It's chapter four, I believe, if you really want to read about it. And as we apply this data, we'll, we'll go into that. But um, just want you to know it needs to be done. Going back just a little bit um, to look at these diagrams in case someone's not familiar or just, you know, a couple of terms that we'll be using uh, the rest of the time. You've got distance again on your y-axis on these um, Purdue pro probe diagram charts and time on the x-axis. This solid line, the solid black line is representing a vehicle trajectory. So again, it's progressing across a corridor as it's going down the screen. Um, and it, time is progressing as you move to the right. Uh, you can start to see at point one where a vehicle starts to slow. And so you can see that curve start to change from the free, free flow trajectory. At two, it stops. At three, it starts to accelerate again, and at four, it reaches the free flow trajectory. That free flow trajectory is useful for a couple of things, but you can see here by kind of like representing, drawing that out, um, we can visually represent um, both control delay. We can also represent stop delay with a couple of those points we measured. And this is just, you know, simply from those individual trajectory points and the speed that we're getting from the vehicles at those trajectory points. And so, um, just want to walk through a few different metrics that we can get uh, with the Purdue probe diagram. Uh, first level of service. And so all we've done here is drawn an imaginary free flow trajectory, a certain number of delay seconds behind um, the theoretical free flow trajectory through the intersection, the zero time. And then we can visually represent in that way, you know, where a level of service trajectory might be. It's not a perfect analysis, but visually it's, it works. Um, and we've color coded here so you can quite easily see what's going on. And then here you can see this was uh, over five days, 136 vehicles for the same time period. Um, and you can easily see the number of vehicles that are experiencing what amount of delay. We've thrown a pie chart up here as well so that you can, so that you can see how those numbers break down. We can also look at arrivals on green, and so uh, I might have missed it, but if, uh, if you hadn't noticed, a horizontal line represents a stop in vehicle, right? Time is progressing, but the vehicle is not progressing, and so this is a very obvious representation of that. The orange being a stop, a vehicle that has to stop on approach at 200 feet, uh, not prior to the stop bar, but prior to the far side of the intersection. A green line is representing that free flow vehicle slightly deviates from the free flow trajectory as it slows through the intersection, but um, still progresses through. And so again, those same 136 vehicles uh, through over multiple days, and you can see their various stops. Um, you can start to pick out in here where, you know, how far they might have stopped upstream if you wanted to. I believe you can even pick out a couple of double stops there. And so split failures, a split failure, again, very simple. It means you had to stop for, you know, you arrived and the signal was not green. The signal became green and you had to stop again before you could get through. So we're just looking for two horizontal lines. And that second one needs to happen after you've re re reached that free flow trajectory again. And so this is simply what we're looking for to identify a split failure. Um, and then we can represent this. Sorry. So orange is one stop. Uh, red is a split failure and uh, purple is a split failure, but you stopped even more than twice. And so um, you can see each of those picked out and they're color coded for visual inspection. And again, you can just pull out the numbers as well 
if needed, um, to get metrics out of it. Uh, downstream blockages, it was a newer one uh, to me to see represented on a metric that we can get out of this. And again, we're not reliant upon uh, uh, vehicle traffic infrastructure and where our detectors are located. So we can follow these trajectories past an intersection. And so here uh, they've drawn a free flow trajectory line 10 seconds after um, the standard or the theoretical free flow trajectory. And that's where we're gonna determine if a vehicle stops just past the intersection and proceeds past that 10 second line, that that is a downstream blockage. And so that's a vehicle getting a green, proceeding through the intersection, but stopping soon after and presumably causing a, a backup into the signal before. So that means you have a signal that's downstream causing a blockage of the signal upstream um, and preventing good operations. And so this is a visual representation of that, the blue line, the dark blue line representing um, your downstream blockage after you've crossed the intersection, which is the light blue line. And so here we can just see that. You can see all of your um, arrivals on green as well as your vehicles that stopped before and then your vehicles that stopped after the intersection, your downstream blockage. We can also just uh, pull that out as a metric as well. So one more thing you can do with these Purdue probe diagrams, these are the same trajectory lines. Uh, we've just zoomed out so far that they look like straight up and down lines. We can look at the time of day um, and we can simply determine for this signal where we might actually want to focus our efforts. You know, on visual inspection, it appears the AM uh, operates well, the midday not as well, not as well, and then the PM obviously is where we might want to look. And then by pulling out individual times a day and trajectories for those times a day, we can kind of further confirm that and that we have a, a split failure issue in the PM peak that we really want to address. Um, going back to that last slide, we could also see that that creeped into the evening and so we might want to address that as well um, and not just assume that it's returning to great operations. But hopefully what I'm hoping you'll take away from this is, you know, you can take all of this data over an entire period of day or over an entire corridor and start to see where you might want to focus your efforts um, on a signal or on a signalized corridor. Arterial travel time is something else that's beneficial. So here's a scatter plot of travel time through a, an entire corridor um, and how long it took each vehicle to go through. This is very cool because we don't have to deploy any um, detection equipment. Um, we don't have to go out and perform counts, no labor intensive work there. Um, so this is very scalable uh, to what we might do. If you have a study that you need to perform or you have a closure that happened that you wanna analyze, that data is getting recorded and you can go get it. Um, something cool is you can look at local effects of this data and so again we saw those trip deviations earlier on a previous screen and so on the left there you can see from a high level yeah we're trying to look at vehicles going up and down this corridor how long it takes them to get through there's an obvious trip deviation there and so you can set up a geofence with the data that simply identifies that trip so that you can remove it out. And so we're looking at that same scatter plot from before, the red are the trip times that we want to remove simply because of a trip deviation or trip chaining. Um, and if you look really closely, uh, you should be able to tell it's not obvious which trips would have been removed if you had used other statistical methods. You either would have had to leave in some times that were, were trip deviations or potentially take out times that were not trip deviations. And so that's you know, beneficial, not previously able to be done with certain detection methodologies. And this is just the statistical uh, results of that. You can see the average dropped quite significantly. Um, the maximum, you know, obviously was well dropped off, but the average probably would not have been that as accurate without this method. Um, and so really what we're talking about for arterial travel time is the potential to both improve our calculation methods at a cheaper cost than we're collecting this data now. Um, so corridor performance, we looked at those PPDs, primary, per, Purdue probe diagrams primarily on an intersection level. Um, it would also be very beneficial to use these for a corridor evaluation. And so we can kind of take each of those Purdue probe diagrams and the metrics um, pulled out of them, delay, arrivals on green, split failures, and downstream blockages, and summarize those into a 15 minute block of what you, you would have seen for an individual time of day and then throw it into this chart. And so what we've got is not quite 24 hours of the day, but most of the hours of the day across the X axis, nine intersections for a corridor on the Y axis, and then again, 
data summarized into 15 minute blocks for how each of those metrics is performing so that we can look at this entire corridor for an entire day, a summary of an average weekday, um, and start to pick out where we might want to focus. Um, again, generally, it's just a heat map, and so red is bad, green is good. That's all two and one are trying to point out to you, um, but we can start to pick out some of those metrics. Um, and while this is extremely beneficial, we are still only looking at one um, direction of travel through the corridor. Uh, it would be beneficial to look at every through movement and every left turn um, going through a corridor. And so Purdue also developed uh, this graphic, um, which is highly beneficial. What you're looking at here is those same four metrics we saw on the last screen for 23 intersections on a corridor in Georgia. <laughs> um, and 3,000 data points for each intersection times 32 intersections across this entire um, chart. And so that's highly beneficial. Uh, I promise on the PDF version you can zoom in and see every 15 minute block very clear. And so that becomes very, very helpful if you want to understand a corridor quickly um, and where you might want to focus your efforts. And the analysis to run this entire uh, graphic was about $1 and so if you're collecting that data, if you've purchased that data already and you have automated processes set up, then it's a very, very low cost to produce a graphic like this um, as opposed to saying going out and you know, collecting counts, um, I don't know, other various things you might need to do. We can also analyze network performance. Um, so this is a similar you know, method except we've shown individual intersections. So each dot up here represents an intersection in Indianapolis. Uh, there's a little over 100 on the screen. And it's just for a single hour of the day um, represented for those same, we'll eventually have all four metrics on the screen, but for those same four metrics. Um, and in a heat map version, red is good, green is bad. So we can start to see very quickly that the north end of town operates well. Um, the central part of town uh, does not. And then there's a corridor over on the left um, that it appears to run as a more traditional uh, corridor that might need some focus. Uh, looking into split failures and downstream blockages, we really start to see that those closely, closely spaced intersections downtown um, start to create downstream blockages that need to be addressed. Um, furthermore, that corridor uh, off to the west of town um, is experiencing the same. We can take those same metrics and use them as a ranking. And so once you start to throw that up, you can see your highest delays. You can see your highest arrivals on green or your lowest arrivals on green. You can see your highest split failures and your highest downstream blockages. And so quickly you can really start to pick out, you know, the handful of intersections that you really want to focus your time on. These are all things generally we've been trying to do with ATS PMs and SIG ops metrics over the years. Um, but again, we start to get metrics outside of where we have detectors. Um, and so it's just beneficial in that way. All right, a few more things we could do uh, just really quickly before after studies. So that it, it's what this starts to become highly beneficial for. And so here's one corridor in particular I'd just like to walk through. Um, We've got level of service shown for before and after. This is a corridor of 11 intersections in Indianapolis where a, or in Indiana where um, a major interchange closure happened nearby. And so traffic was diverted to this corridor and we're doing you know, two weeks before and two weeks after of data to start to see you know, what the impacts are. And um, we can quickly see the intersections two all the way through eight experienced significant delays over what they did previously. Looking at arrivals on green, we really start to pick out a couple more that are rough. Uh, intersection 8 in particular uh, was not struggling too, too bad before, but is now. But even then, again, intersections 2 through 8 all have issues with arrivals on green. Um, this starts to tell a slightly different story. Uh, we had already picked out intersection 8, but we start to see before that we had almost no split failures in the entire corridor. Now we have several, but it's very clear to us, you know, Intersection 8, the only one exceeding 25% is where we might want to look. And then when we go to downstream blockages, we start to see um, intersections 3 through 7 all have 
over 25% downstream blockages, which, you know, intersection seven is your upstream signal, intersection eight is your downstream. We know we have split failures at eight. We're seeing downstream blockages at seven through three. So um, really, if we just go all the way back to the beginning, you might have set out to really start timing five or six signals based on what you see here, but we can pretty quickly pick out that if there's anything we need to prioritize, it's intersection eight. Um, and so that's really cool. You can see the entire corridor. And again, if this closure had happened, you know, you didn't have to go out and put out any detection equipment before and after to get these, these representations. Just travel time through the corridor, we've kind of already talked about that. Um, another cool way to look at the same data, we can throw those trajectories up as well. Um, and if, you know, with the benefit of uh, bigger graphics, you'd be able to dive in there and start seeing where the individual split failures are in those trajectories. Um, and we can throw our split failures, downstream blockages, rivals on green and beside that, and kind of stretch out those graphics so that those heat maps match up very well with the distance of each intersection. Um, and it's just the same thing we were looking at, but it really starts to make sense exactly what's happening on this corridor. It kind of feels like you've got, you know, a model that you've run and you're watching the individual trajectories going through. That's cool, but we don't need to talk about it. Cumulative frequency diagrams, we can make those too. <laughs> uh, so this would be a different way to look at a before and after study for more for a signal timing focused application. And so in this location, we've got before on the left, or this graphic, we've got before uh, occurrence on the left and after occurrence on the right. The top graphics are both upstream signals, the bottom graphics are both downstream signals, and you can just see on the left, on the bottom, we've got a very low ar arrival on green, leading to a high amount of downstream blockages on the top left. Um, after some retiming, um, you can see that those downstream blockages were resolved uh, by increasing the arrivals on green. And so if you set out to an intersection and you know that's something you want to address, we can quickly represent that and understand it. Um, and that is something we would have struggled previously with ATSPMs. All right, a few other applications. Um, again, this is highly beneficial for screen screening our networks, corridors, and intersections. Um, but one thing that would be been more beneficial to a practitioner is to also be getting data back that says not only is this an intersection that needs addressing, I think a lot of us have seen over the years the same corridors, the same intersections come up, but methodologies are described in this study um, for identifying intersections that have individual movements uh, that are over capacity uh, while also having other movements within that intersection that might have green time to give. And so that starts to become really cool. This chart looks similar, but it's actually got phases on the left side, on the y-axis of the screen as opposed to intersections. And so here you can see it's, it's highlighted phase four and eight for having a significant amount of split failures. Um, but we can see that we could easily steal time from three and seven or even from two and six here in order to start helping those rather than just sending us an intersection that is completely over capacity. Um, and so again, that methodology is described in the study. Um, Closely spaced intersections are another uh, application that could be very cool for this. So you're thinking your diamond interchanges, um, but even intersections that we put out that are deliberately designed because uh, they have closely spaced intersections and their goals are to improve operations. So a DDI, a CFI, something like that. Um, you know, you're going to want to know after you install it that you have it timed well because if it's not timed well, you know, you're not getting the benefit out of that project. And so we can easily watch vehicle trajectories go through both intersections. Um, this is one, uh, I'm gonna forget the location for this one. But this is one that's got more traditional timing on it. Um, and so you can see four movements here. Uh, the top has westbound through the, or north and southbound through the corridor. And then the two bottom graphics have a eastbound left approaching the interchange and then going north and a westbound left going through the interchange and then going south. We can kind of readily start to pick out that this intersect or interchange is very well timed for the westbound left turn um, to get those greens through. So if for whatever reason, you know, that's where you have your backup on the interstate and that's where you're trying to prevent rear end crashes. You know, you can conclude that this was successful, but you can easily see that all the other approaches get a lot of stops in the middle of that interchange. And so um, if you don't have enough storage, you can see where that would start to become a problem. And another example, very similar setup, um, 
you know, this is in Texas, and so using, uh, gosh, Texas four phase uh, diamond phasing that they use out there. Um, their goals are entirely to get folks through both intersections at the same time. And so if you're going out there trying to understand is this timing effective for that, we can very quickly see yes. In fact, they, in almost all cases, vehicles proceed right through both intersections. And so it becomes beneficial for that. But we can also, you know, we don't have to limit our scope there. We can look upstream and start to see that that phasing does, um, because it essentially operates like split phasing uh, for those entering uh, from the east, from the north and the south. Um, we can see that, you know, we're getting split failures and sometimes even stopping more than twice on the main line to get through this intersection. It's really not to uh, give credence to one or the other. It's just um, observing the differences between both phasing um, options. Roundabouts, uh, Scott didn't even show up and I put a roundabout on my slide for once, but um, there is a whole chapter dedicated in the study to roundabout performance measures. Um, and so really, you know, this doesn't necessarily just have to be for traffic signals. Um, I think the limits of probe data have always been there due to link segments. And so um, we can really start to do a lot with this data. We've talked about scalability. Uh, there's the link again. I don't have a pretty uh, QR code. I'm sorry, but I'm happy to text or email that to you if you need it. Thank you, Justin, for giving us valuable insights into how we can use connected vehicle data to analyze signal performance at an intersection level, corridor level, and at a network level without relying on vehicle detectors. So hopefully we can see Purdue probe diagram and the other charts in the GDOT ATSPM soon, I guess. On that note, I would like to introduce and welcome our presenters for the final presentation of the session. So we have two presenters for the third presentation. So first up, we have Jeff War. Having grown up in Metro Atlanta, Jeff War has spent much of his career around developing solutions for traffic and transportation in the state of Georgia. Jeff has Jeff has a bachelor's from, and a master's also, Jeff, from Georgia Tech? OK. <laughs> Okay, Jeff has a bachelor's from Georgia Institute of Technology. He's a licensed professional engineer. He is also a licensed professional traffic operations engineer and also a licensed road safety professional. He is an active member of ITE since 2005 and has been on several committees. And at Jacobs, Jeff works with the talent group of team to plan, analyze, and deliver a wide variety of operational and safety improvement projects. And our second presenter is Julie Shipper. She works with Streetlight at Jacobs Company. She is a, a customer success manager in the Synergy team at Streetlight. And she's been with Jacobs for the past year. And prior to working at Jacobs, she spent eight years at New York City Department of Transportation to improve the New York City streets. And also during COVID, she spearheaded the New York City's outdoor dining program. She holds a master's degree in civil engineering and urban planning and has a strong background in transportation planning. So their presentation is titled Practical Applications of Big Data for Transportation in Georgia Using Streetlight Data. So on that note, I welcome both first Julie first and then Jeff. I'm not sure how to put it into presentation mode, but if someone from the IT. Oh, it's a PDF. 
All right, we'll just uh, go with this. Um, thank you, Matthews, for that uh, introduction. Uh, All right, thank you. Cool. Um, I want to thank the Georgia IT Conference for having us here today. Um, we're going to be talking about our, uh, the use of big data um, through some practical applications here in Georgia. Um, and you, know, you guys have gotten a pretty good overview of big data from the first two presentations. So uh, we'll walk through it. But specifically, we'll be talking about streetlight data um, and the use of that here in Georgia. So I will start with an introduction. Um, start with what Streetlight Data is, and then turn it over to Jeff to talk about some of his projects here in Georgia where he's used our data. Um, so what exactly is Streetlight? Well, as discussed in both of the prior presentations, everything that is moving these days is generating data. So we have leveraged connected vehicle data, um, as well as some other uh, data from cell phones and other location-based um, services. Uh, to really understand mobility and measure how vehicles, bikes, pedestrians, um, and trucks are moving throughout our streets. Streetlight has pioneered the use of big data analytics uh, to shed light on how our people and goods are moving um, to empower some smarter and data-driven transportation decisions. Um, our proprietary uh, processing engine is transforming trillions of data points um, over time into standard transportation metrics um, for vehicles and transit um, and uh, just to see how people and bikes and such are moving throughout our streets. Um, so, let's see. Okay, so how exactly does it work? Well, Streetlight um, is an on-demand interactive software platform um, that opens up in a regular browser like Google Chrome. Um, and on this web platform, it can be used to analyze and visualize travel patterns in your neighborhood, towns, um, and across the country. And Jeff will talk a little bit more about how he has used that. So typical transportation metrics such as turning movement counts, um, annual average daily counts, orange destination, are all really available at your fingertips. Um, and so taking all of the data points that basically uh, were talked about in the first two presentations and distilling it into uh, metrics that be can, can be used by planners and engineers alike. Um, so we take all of these points, process it through our machine um, processing engine, and then it comes out with some data points that are used uh, for these different types of trips. So this technology is really integrated so that co your colleagues and, and yourself can really help guide uh, the best analytic solutions and ensure metrics that are providing um, a relevance to the challenge. So the ultimate outcome here is that a project that uses big data um, is really helping our clients make better decisions so that they are the most satisfied. Um, you'll see how Jeff gets to use all of this, but basically taking all of these different data points, such as these connected vehicle data um, and LBS data, uh, and really distilling it. Um, but using this data, you can really understand different types of metrics and travel patterns around your region. Um, you can collect vehicle counts or bike counts um, on all road segments and see how that changes through a typical day. Um, or seasonally throughout the year. And our Streetlight solution really helps our clients make transparent data-driven decisions. So what kind of data do we use here? So I talked a little bit about it, but since 2011, we have harnessed hundreds of different data sources that contribute to our uh, processing engine. Um, this is you know, a, developing an unmatched transportation data processing capabilities. Um, and we're really understanding a deep understand, an empirical understanding of how North America's roads and sidewalks have now are interacting together. But it's not really simply about the data itself. Rather, we're distilling massive amounts of transportation data into actionable insights um, so that you can make informed decisions on how to change your roads. Um, this map just shows all of our different agency partners, and you can see it's really being used throughout the country and Canada. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Jeff to really talk about the meat here of how he has used our data um, and used our platform to transform some streets in Georgia. Thanks. 
<clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, so I think as, as I was introduced, I've, I've got a lot of operations and, and safety planning projects that tend to come across my desk. Um, and, and we achieve those results through forecasting and analysis of traffic data. Uh, so uh, with all of this, this big data uh, sort of applications that we're getting, it's, it's made me really, really excited um, for the opportunities that it provides us to, to better understand how the uh, traffic patterns move through our networks. And uh, honestly, it's, it's really kind of just a big toy for me to play with <laughs> during my analysis. So um, I have five projects here that kind of uh, show some of maybe scratching the surface of, of what big data is doing today and maybe where it'll, it'll be going in the future. So this project here is uh, an analysis that was run for uh, downtown Norcross, a uh, project that was looking at enhancing pedestrian connections. So the first step um, was to verify the demands and patterns that we had seen and heard from previous studies and, and surveys. So we uh, made a hex map in Arc ArcGIS, a bunch of little hexagons to cover, cover the study area, imported them as zones into Streetlight, and uh, ran a query for, for multiple days and times to look where the pedestrian activity was and, and how high was it. Um, I thought it was interesting uh, if you sort of look at these graphs here, sort of the, the tall hexagons are, are areas of high pedestrian activity, um, the low hexagons areas of lower pedestrian activity. We also get time of day and, and uh, uh, day of the week. So if you peel back those and look underneath some of those hexagons, you'll see a high level activity along Beaufort Highway, which I think conforms to what we, we know Beaufort Highway to be. Um, we all can also can see some of the approach routes that pedestrians are taking uh, through North Peachtree Street or uh, Langford Road. And uh, if we, we go into some of those, those very tall peaks, uh, for example, on the left-hand side, we've got a very tall peak that's not uh, active on the weekend. You'll see that that's actually a, a middle and elementary school. Uh, another thing that, that can be done with uh, the big data for this project is uh, tying those pedestrian trips to ac actual socioeconomic information uh, through uh, census data. So uh, a lot of this project has a lot of outreach and surveying associated with it. Um, so when you're looking at a, a potential improvement or modification to a pedestrian network, um, it's important to maybe see and find those communities that might be affected by those changes. So this can sort of drive those insights as to, um, you know, these pedestrians, half of these were making uh, less than $75,000 household, or 78% uh, of them were non-work-based trips, or 50% uh, of those were less than 20 minutes. So I think this, this provides a lot of information to sort of go back to the community and, and look and make sure you're reaching out to the right places. Yes, uh, this one was actually actually my first experience with Streetlight, and it was in 2020, uh, so there was a lot going on then. Um, and there's definitely a big need for me to find a way to, to get some additional traffic data. So uh, this project here, we, uh, we were looking at the Paces Ferry Interchange area, sort of all the roads around the interchange, really. Um, on the map to the left, we had some existing data counts, um, numbered one through 10 there. Uh, but we really needed to fill in a lot of gaps. Um, because of what was going on with the pandemic, we couldn't really go out there and just count new cars. Um, we had to kind of look back in time and figure out what was happening at these intersections when things were a little, a little more normal. So um, that, that's when we reached out to Streetlight and um, used their, their platform to pull the, the turning movement count data. And being naturally curious, I, I went ahead and pulled the intersections I already had. <laughs> Uh, just to see how it would compare. So the, uh, the chart in the top right, you can see peak hour volumes uh, for the actual counts, uh, total intersection volumes versus the street light data uh, analysis. Also, I, I did a, a GEH, sort of a fit test that we use in modeling a lot to, to look at the fit of the data. And uh, I, I was pleasantly surprised on, on sort of how well those, those turned out. And uh, we ended up, we're able to use those existing counts to calibrate also the new counts that we got in between the intersections. So we had a lot of high compatibility um, between all that data, and we were able to, to use that further in the analysis. So I, th I thought that 
that was probably a, a good application for this. I think you know areas where maybe you have a project that suddenly expands by an intersection <laughs> or um, a shelved project with old data can be refreshed maybe using some of these big data applications. Uh, I think a bread and butter application of big data is definitely origin and destination. Um, I think it's, it's something that's useful a lot in analysis and modeling. Um, this is a, a project on Monroe Boulevard near 10th Street. And uh, it was to, to model how changes at the Beltline crossing for their Northeast Trail extension uh, were going to affect, uh, really, I don't know if you want to count them as four or five closely spaced intersections um, within 1,000 feet of each other. Um, so uh, in the modeling of this, it was really critical to understand these origins and destinations. Otherwise, when we got into the process, we would have to um, maybe calibrate out uh, a bunch of unrealistic lane changes or turn sequences. Uh, for those of you that have modeled uh, interchanges and the like, you'll have that situation where someone gets off the interchange and then back on the interchange going in the other direction that you, you want to model, not model that. <laughs> as being realistic. So uh, the origins and destinations here uh, were really helpful in that calibration process, saving us that time. Uh, this, this application here, so we were uh, working in Midtown and looking at potential bike uh, routes uh, for the Midtown Alliance. And uh, it was an important factor we were using for determining uh, level of traffic stress was, was the ADTs on each of these blocks. Um, so it was sort of an early uh, sketch planning activity uh, to, to get these levels of traffic stress to know where, where things sort of stood in, in the network today. And uh, I know ADT can be challenging uh, to collect in downtown areas for, for numerous reasons. We've got you know, queued vehicles in some blocks or curb parking in others, uh, travel shifts from anything that could be going on downtown at the time or, um, you know, God forbid, more construction uh, during your, your data collection process. So um, Streetlight was a good helpful uh, tool here in mining those volumes um, throughout several blocks um, in that area. We were able to, to get that sort of sketch planning activity up and running with some convincing data points um, to, to help really drive those solutions early in the project. Now we've got the last one here. Um, I cheated a little bit because this one hadn't really started and it was more of a scoping exercise, but um, I, I, I really wanted to use the tool on this, so I did it anyway. Uh, this is a, uh, an evaluation that was prepared uh, looking at uh, potential impacts of speeding and cut through traffic in a, in a neighborhood um, that's adjacent to Kennesaw State University. Um, so the neighborhood had, had complaints about you know, the speeding and cut through traffic um, there were suspicions that it had to do with the back entrance to Kennesaw State University. So we took that big data and uh, looking at that back entrance, we're able to trace the origins and destinations, sort of like a select link analysis for, for travel demand modelers out there. And uh, if you, you trace that big red line back, um, we actually saw that it ended right at some student apartments. So there, there may be some validity to, to some of those complaints. Um, it, it may be... Uh, uh, a good application also uh, in those situations when you're dealing with neighborhoods, you'll often have neighbors pitted against each other thinking traffic's worse on one street than another street, um, and this can, this can really sort of maybe help build that consensus. All right, I think we're nearly out of time. Thank you, Julie and Jeff, for introducing us to Streetlight and how we can use it to solve all types of traffic problems and use it in a wide variety of traffic studies. So we'll take some quick questions now. Like, so it, audience, anybody with questions can come up and our panelists are ready to answer those questions. Uh, question about uh, specifically the probe data for um, signal performance measures moving forward. Kind of, is there a prevailing vision for where that data source is headed, and all of that looks like to 
for agencies to be able to stand up a platform like that and use that type of data because one of the benefits of the current ATSPM system is it's your data, it's on your system, on your network. Um, so curious if you all know where that's going. Yeah, don't have a great answer at the moment. All of that from the enhanced traffic signal performance pooled fund study was based on Weijo data, um, which we were acquiring, but is suddenly an issue. So um, we'll be looking into that. Certainly, um, you know, we'll certainly be purchasing the data. That's, uh, I think, a given, but um, there's benefits to having that data, you know, on hand at GDOT. I think all of a sudden data management, like I mentioned, becomes a challenge. We're struggling through that at GDOT now with a lot of other things as well. So um, I think we're just going to be working on it and taking advice uh, from folks. So not a great answer. We'll keep you informed. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I guess I'll ask a question to Justin. When, when do you think in the near future you'll see Purdue probe, probe diagram in the G dot ATSP? I'd like to see them in, incorporated at some point, and especially the most, you know, sometimes starting small uh, with something implementable and practical. So I think the closely spaced intersections are something that we currently don't analyze extremely well uh, where Purdue probe diagrams are just in general that would benefit. So we'd like to see it, yeah. Okay. Okay. I guess I'll ask a question for Jairaj. Uh, do you envision some sort of an app or application that public can use for interstate mobility? So uh, we do have an app right now that the Indiana Department of Transportation uses, but as the adoption grows and as more and more states come on board, we can definitely explore that, yeah, I'd love to see that. Maybe some work we could do together. <laughs> <laughs> yep, um, I guess we're on time, so we'll get ready for the next session, and before that, we have an announcement. So the volleyball tour tournament will be starting at 1.30 and not at 1 o'clock, it'll be at 1.30. Right, Jody? All right. Cool. So.